puzzle started with a prayer, a question, a thought that I had when first approaching the Kotel in August 1967, just after the Israelis had retaken Jerusalem. And what I saw was very happy Israelis celebrating, smiles on their faces, and very sullen Palestinians. And I had the thought immediately, these people don't like each other. They, they, they don't get along. Um, if there's anything I can do to help make peace, let me know. I was uh, sitting in my apartment in Newton, Massachusetts in 1968, and I had this urge to look at the beginning of Genesis in Hebrew, which was a strange urge considering the fact that I didn't read Hebrew, although I did know the alphabet. Now, I have one talent in this world, and that is I'm a visual pattern recognizer. Maybe has become evident already. <laughs> um, and my eyes fell on the letters, and I could not get it out of my head that there was something peculiar about the sequence of letters. It just didn't look like language to me. Since I couldn't read it, that was a further reason why it didn't look like language. <laughs> um, if it had looked like language, if I had been a good student in my earlier days and had learned to read Hebrew, I would have, just like you pick up a piece of paper in any language, you don't start counting letters and look at letter patterns. You simply read what's said there. And I never would have seen this. You know, if you hold up a newspaper and you can read the words, you never look at the letters. It would be very difficult to do. But I looked at the letters and all of the bells and whistles in my brain went off. All those pattern recognizing alarms went off and said there is something most unusual, something peculiar about this sequence of letters. So I asked around, assuming that Genesis was the most heavily researched document going, and people told me they didn't know what I was talking about. I asked a rabbi, I asked a priest, I went over to MIT, I went over to Harvard, I, nothing. Eventually people told me this must be Kabbalah, it must be Hebrew mysticism. <coughs> well, I'd never heard of Kabbalah, um, so I decided I'd better get educated if I was going to figure out what was going on here. And I realized that if no one knew about this, and there really was some kind of coding in the letters of the text of Genesis, then this could be very important. So, I spent from 1968 until 1978, when we moved to San Francisco, collecting and reading just about every text in English that I could find that was on mystical traditions. Now, I read Kabbalistic material, Hebrew tradition. I read Christian and Muslim. I read Hindu and Buddhist and Taoist and, and ancient um, civilizations of all kinds. I read Greek metaphysics, all translations in English, but a very wide gamut. I read things that were even written by people who claimed to be up in flying sources. I was completely indiscriminate. And I started to put together a sense that even though I couldn't figure out what they were talking about, it was very nice poetry. And yes, there might very well be meditations involved. Um, the literary criticism methods that the academic scholars use to make sense of Kabbalistic texts didn't do much for me. Yes, I could see you compare this sentence to that sentence, but that didn't tell me anything about what the author was saying. It just told me he was saying the same thing here as here. And eventually, after 10 years, I started to build up a sense that these Kabbalistic texts were talking about something. There was just too many details for it to be pulled out of the air. There was just too much commonality to be, to be the, these texts to be the individual experiences of, of, of mystics. Over those years, over the 10 years, I had realized that if there was a pattern in the text, and if I was going to show it to somebody else, then I had to follow the scientific method. People had claimed for centuries that these texts were special. This is a sacred text. Being able to show that to skeptical, technical, modern minds like the people I was associating with was very difficult. So I had drawn up a set of criteria, a set of scientific tests of, of kind of postulates that I expected to be checked off one by one. I did not want to do what many people do and go and make guesses and get ahead of myself or go fishing because that would short circuit the scientific method. It was absolutely essential that I make a plan, and I stick to it, and I unfold it step by step, just as good science has done. And it finally dawned on me that the first verse of Genesis had a string of 27 letters followed by the 27th letter. 
It's 28 letters all together. 27 letters, the 27th letter, and a 27 letter alphabet that comes along with it. Three statements of 27, and 27 is three cubed. I said to myself, gee, I wonder what would happen if I counted the letters out in base three, by threes. Well, I ultimately tried other bases also, but when I counted by threes, interesting things started to happen. You know, if you look for 20 years, and you're reasonably clever, you're going to find patterns. There's no big deal to finding patterns. The question isn't whether you can find patterns. The question is whether they have any meaning. If you introduce an idea, and it has nothing to do with what you're doing, you won't get any new information out by using that idea. When I use base three to count out the letters, the whole first verse becomes one unit. There aren't any letters left over. Everything has its place. A rabbinic teaching. And the teaching is that the Torah is eternal. The Torah is unique. It's not just a bunch of stories. It's not like anything else, not even like anything else sacred in Judaism, such as the Talmud, which is extremely important. The basis of Jewish practice is in the Talmud. But the Torah can't even be compared to the Talmud. That would be sacrilege. Torah is so unique, it can only be compared to itself. So I decided to compare it to itself. It seemed reasonable. How do you compare a text to itself? Well, now, are we back to literary criticism? Should I look at the, the first story in Genesis of, Gen of the creation and the second and compare how they differ? Well, that's already been done. It wasn't very satisfying. And besides, it didn't give me anything new to work with. I'm looking at the letters. So I said, what would happen if I compared the letters to themselves? And that's what I did. You know how you make a paper doll or a paper airplane? Take a piece of paper, and you stick tab A into slot A, and then you put tab B into slot B, and tab C into slot C. You auto-correlate it. You correlate it with itself. Tab A with slot A, tab B with slot B. And the piece of paper folds up, hopefully, into the model it was intended to make. And so I decided to fold up this string of letters in such a way that letters that were the same were going to be next to each other. I wrote the letters out, one each, on a bead, on a bead chain, in the order that they were written in the text. So you could literally hold out the bead chain and read the first verse of Genesis. And then I took the bead chain and curled it up on itself so that the same letters lined up when we associated the letters slot A in tab A, tab B in slot B, etc., just like the paper pattern. And as you can see, all the letters are accounted for. They're all paired up. And if they're not paired with the same letter, like slot A and tab A and slot B and tab B, they're paired with letters that are in symmetrical positions in the alphabet. So there's a very basic, simple rule that enables all the letters of the first verse to be self-connected, just like the tabs and slots. The reason I started it here, rather than on the edge someplace, is because I realized this was on the surface of a donut, which one could pull through. And I didn't want these lines to cross over in funny ways, so I simply rotated it through itself. But if it were on the surface of a donut, then that would all work as one, one unit. And so that's what the first verse of Genesis draws. It draws a kind of donut called a two torus, a two-dimensional surface on a torus. So we've now identified the first verse of Genesis. It folds itself up into a donut. This is the bagel theory of reality. <laughs> you just peel the seven color map off of the donut, and you have a little vortex. This is the defi definition of the donut. You don't need the rest of the donut. Mathematicians don't need the dough. They just want to know what the surface is, you know, how it all fits together. They don't. And what we found, and this is really quite startling, is when we simplified it mathematically, we ended up producing a form that looked just like this. This is the form we actually made. This is a minimal geometric way to represent the way the first verse of Genesis forms itself when its letters are paired up, just like making a paper model. Now, you'll probably notice 
particularly if you know something of, of Jewish tradition and teaching, that this looks a little like a flame. And letters are said to come from a flame or from fire. They were written in fire on the original tablets given to Moshe. If you look at this form from different directions, you can see all shadows, two-dimensional outlines of all the Hebrew letters. Uh, we're pretty sure the same form, or some very, very closely related form, produces the Arabic letters, and a related form, but not quite the same, produces the Greek letters. And so we've got the first verse of Genesis folding itself up into a form that, when you look at the form from different directions, makes all the letters in which the text is written. And so we have our fruit tree yielding fruit whose seed is in itself, and when we look at it from the appropriate directions, for instance, that direction, let me hold it here, it might be easier, we see the Hebrew letter bait. The English equivalent, uh, the English equivalent would be the letter B, the Greek would be beta. This object, this entirely asymmetrical object, which in the past we've identified as a flame, flame of consciousness, Hebrew letters are said to come from flame, Arabic letters are said to come from flame. Shadows of that object of this object are all of these Hebrew letters. Same one object generates all of these letters of the alphabet. Here is a text written in an alphabet that curls itself up into a form that casts shadows that are the letters that the text is written in. Fruit tree yielding fruit whose seed is in itself. That is very self-embedded. That is very self-referential. That's a very reflexive process. It's creating its own letters in which it's written. Again, this is a key idea. But. Don't be overly impressed. If I had taken a coat hanger and bent it up with a couple of squiggles and played around with my, my shadows, I'd have found all the letters in just about any alphabet. It is not hard to find shadows of a squiggly form that look like letters. It's hard to find an explicit meaningful form that does that. And so it's the fact that that's a meaningful form that counts, not just that you can make shadowgrams that make letters. We've also discovered, even more startlingly, that this is not just a flame representing the flame of consciousness, but it's also a model hand representing our self-awareness. It's our hand that designates us as special in the animal world. It's our opposable thumb that is associated with our ability to make and use language and to make and use tools. It is from the word for hand in Latin, manus, that we are called humans. And further, it's from the region of our mind that controls our hand that we derive the regions that control our speech. And there is another point that needs to be added. Not only in Hebrew tradition is it taught that the letters are made of fire or flame, but they are also said to come from yod. And that is taken to mean the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the letter Yud, which is the component that makes up all the letter shapes. But Yud also means hand, this hand. And when you look at this form from various different positions, you see all of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. When you make different gestures with your own hands, you see different outlines, different shadows of the same model. In fact, you can see all the Hebrew letters. And you know what? Each Hebrew letter has a name. And the name of the letter Pei, the letter Pei, its name means mouth. And you see it when you make this gesture. That's the Hebrew letter Pei. After Pei, mouth, is Tzadi, righteousness. The tzadi is apparent when you pull your hands up and tip them back like this. And I can see the tzadi wound around my thumb and my right hand. Now, I think this is sort of the clean hands gesture or something like that, where you're showing the backs of your hands are clean, you're holding them up. It's, it's a kind of purification holding form. And I think I can show you that tzadi. This is the Rashi Nachmadi tzadi right over here. And if you cut it off at about this point, you'll see it quite, a quite nice version of one. Just look on your letter charts. Okay. Once we have the names of the letters, and, and then we have to express them. And it turns out, they, our research came down to the idea 
that you express meaning by pointing to things and the hand gestures are, are universal. Everybody knows that if you, you outline the shape of a, of a basketball in front of you, it means round. And if you spell the Hebrew word for round, Gimel Lamed, your hands are forced to outline a basketball. And there's, we've got some video and some drawings that show some of this. So we've, we end up with putting together this natural process. The, the, we account for the, the stages in the entire life, life process, the embryonic process, by making gestures, and the gestures naturally express the form of the function they represent. And that's the, the main thrust of what we have. That makes it a universal alphabet. The human hand is the human embodiment of a general principle that projects consciousness into physics. And if we look at that general principle of projection from all the possible directions we can look at it, then we can, in theory, take any path possible in consciousness or in physics. I think uh, your use of the mathematical metaphor here is not just an accident. No, not at all, because <laughs> mathematically we understand the idea of truth as modeling something experimental that we find in the real world. If someone says they have a truth and they use a spiritual sense, we tend to laugh at them. Well, your truth, your truth, whose truth is truth? But if these texts were canonized based on the fact that the sequence of letters was as precise and explicit as the sequence of digits in, say, a universal constant like pi, then we have a whole different understanding of what might have been meant by the various sages of these various traditions claiming they had the truth. So that's what we have here. Um, we have a natural, universal gesture language turned into a formal system for recording and playing back meditational exercises, which can become the true basis for a science of consciousness, which in modern terms becomes a religion, um, or several religions, actually. In fact, that's also what this model talks about. This is a wonderful model of, of everything. By definition, this isn't a jealous god of a petty people who says, my God's bigger and better than your God because it's my God, and it's the one God because I say so. That's not what we're saying here. I'm saying we are starting with a definition of singularity and wholeness. Definitions are not the basis of prejudice. It's a postulate. I'm putting it down to see how good it is. It doesn't give us anything. And if we look for the means of spanning between the one and the many, we have a path that includes everything in the universe. Now, modern physics attempts a bottom-up reconstruction. Take all the diversity we find, all the forces in the world, and pump the energy up until things merge together, and eventually we can extrapolate and find the Big Bang, the one from the many. And I'm saying we can do this abstractly. We can do this topologically in principle without any electron microscopes and cyclotrons and supercomputers. We can start top-down by definition, start with a singularity, break it up by minimal first distinction, and end up with all there is. This is very controversial material because, um, in the words of a friendly scholar, it can't be so. Um, and what, of course, he means is that if it is so, then there's a lot of readjustment to make. Um, and I try to explain to people that this really doesn't say anything like, I'm right and you're all wrong. Um, it says, rather, that this is a deeper level that integrates a whole range of material. And it demonstrates mostly that what the scholars have been saying and what the religious people have been saying um, and what the different religious people have been saying, they've all been right, but in their own contexts. And that if you go deeper, then you find something more common. If I've done my work by using the scientific method properly, if I've done my work properly, that this is not based on an opinion, it's based on a hypothesis that has faced every form of criticism, criticism you can imagine. And this, these are de demonstrable principles, not just beliefs. And, and that's what we found. That's, what, that's the basis of what we're doing. Demonstrating to the scientific community that traditional material handed down over thousands of years is valid today will provide great respect for the traditional material.
and demonstrating to observant people, to religiously intense people, that what they've been protecting and carrying all these years is now respected in the world, will enable them to open to the world a little more and be somewhat less defensive. Now I'm generalizing. I don't mean this is some sort of panacea. But this is part of a legitimate bridge between various seemingly opposite elements in our society, whether it's between science and religion, whether it's between the secular world and the observant world. These same models also generate other sacred alphabets that came later, the Greek alphabet, the Arabic alphabet, are also generated by the same form that the beginning of the text of Genesis draws for us. So we ought to be able to show that some of these other traditions have a connection at this mathematical level, at this consciousness level, and that thereby traditions can respect each other. And this isn't a matter of making everybody's religion the same. Far from it. Those are totally different embodiments we approach from different directions. But the basis, the common element in our consciousness, in our hands, literally, is what we have. And it's the alphabet. And I think that's very beautiful.